the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a bird nerd. And joining me today to talk birds and particularly the amazing lyrebirds of Australia and much more particularly the Albert's lyrebird, the lesser known one, is Fiona Backhouse. And Fiona's doing a PhD at the University of Western Sydney. Fiona, welcome to the Bird Emergency and thanks for being involved. Thank you for having me. Now, tell us in broad terms how you got the idea for your for your project and how are you doing it? That's a very good question. So I actually saw an ad for a project on Albert's lyrebirds. So my supervisors have worked on superb lyrebirds for quite a while. They are the lyrebird lab, that's what they call themselves. And they were interested in looking at the Albert's lyrebird because we don't know a lot about that species and they wanted to know how that compares to the superb lyrebird. And I came across this ad for the project and I thought, lyrebirds, that's pretty cool. I wouldn't mind studying them. I knew I wanted to do a PhD. I knew I was interested in animal behaviour. I also enjoy music. I did a lot of music growing up, so I was interested to see how can I combine music and biology. The answer is birdsong. But I was also really interested in conservation, so I thought how can I approach this from a bit more of a conservation angle. And so instead of looking at how the Yalbert's lyrebird compares to the superb lyrebird, I've been looking at the kind of diversity that you find within the Albert's lyrebird. So... I think most people are, are quite familiar with the amazing vocalisations and the abilities of the superb lyre. And I'd be surprised if there's many bird nerds who haven't seen the David Attenborough BBC footage of one lyre bird in particular. How different is the Alberts when it comes to its calls and the ability for mimicry and how they display compared to the superb lyrebird? So there seem to be a lot of similarities. Both lyrebird species, they obviously mimic, but they have a lot of other vocalisations as well. So both lyrebird species have their own song that we call the whistle song, and that's like their territorial signal. It's a very loud ringing call that you often hear from further away than the rest of it. Then they have the mimicry that we call it the recital mimicry because it's performed in this long string of different mimetic vocalisations without much interruption. Then they have another sort of vocalisation, which in the superb lyrebirds is the dance song, sometimes known as plicking. And that's that really bizarre kind of laser-like sound that people often hear. Albert's lyrebirds have something that seems to be the equivalent, which is called gronking. And that's a very sort of rhythmic, almost percussive sound. And then both species have another set of mimicry that they do after either the dance song or the gronking, which is sometimes called buzz mimicry. And that's mimicry of a a different set of species. It's often alarm calls in superb lyrebirds. Our lab has just published a paper showing that in this other set of mimicry, they mimic mobbing flocks. So a mobbing flock is basically when a bunch of different birds of species get together and they do alarm calls and try and chase off whatever predator is there. So they're similar in having the same categories of vocalizations, but the way they perform them is a bit different. And I, I was reading some of the papers you, you sent along to me, and it seems like different populations of the Albert's lyrebird, quite distinct, but they all seem to have the same song structure, but they have variations in the way those songs are not constructed but performed. I think that's probably the best way to say it. So can you explain the structure of the song? Yeah, so the song you're talking about is the whistle song, which is also known as a territorial song. And that's this very obvious loud song that they do. And basically in all populations, they start off with an introductory note or a couple of introductory notes. And this is often mimicry of other species. So in some species, they mimic a king parrot vocalisation. In others, they mimic a goz, a grey goshawk. I've also heard eastern yellow robin, so, which is quite cool. So do we know or... Have you got any theories about what an individual live bird is trying to say? Are we able to to anthropomorph <laughs> to that extent? Because it's actually fairly common in bird song to have introductory notes or syllables in the song. And they're often quite loud and very simple acoustic structure. So they, they travel well through the environment and they're basically a signal saying, hey, I'm here, I'm about to sing, listen to me. What's weird is that live birds are using 
mimetic sounds for this introductory note. Are they only using birds for that 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 thieve that plagiarised notes for the introduction, or are they doing chainsaws and things like that that they're also hearing in the environment? As far as I'm come across, it's only bird songs, and it's also a very limited set of bird vocalizations they're using, and they all seem to have a similar acoustic structure. So they're all they're all what we call elements. So an element is just one basically note. They're a single note. They're around a similar pitch or frequency, and they're very short as well. So that you can use a few different species, but the sort of acoustic structure of that call is similar across the range. Okay. It seems that the Albert's Bird population is very fragmented. So can you tell us about where they're occurring and then are the males in the different areas isolated from contact with the males in the in other adjoining populations and are they learning from each other or are they making up their own song I guess is what I'm asking. I'll start by talking about their distribution. So for those who don't know Albert's lyrebirds are found in a very small area so while superb lyrebirds are found along much of the east coast of Australia Albert's lyrebirds are found basically on the border between New South Wales and Queensland so in the Gold Coast hinterland area or the scenic rim or the Tweed Valley whatever you want to know it as and in that area, they're basically confined to the higher mountain ridges where there is remaining rainforest. So I believe a lot of that area used to be covered in rainforest, but it's a lot of it's been cleared for farmland or for housing. And so it's quite fragmented now. And so the sort of amount of fragmentation or the amount of isolation that different populations are under depends on where they are. So there are some areas like around Lamington National Park and the Border Ranges National Park, which is still fairly large, intact areas of rainforest. Then you get other places like Tambourine Mountain, which is very isolated. There's only small pockets of rainforest left there and it's completely cut off from the rest of the range. So those males are unlikely to have any contact with the rest of the broader lyrebird population. We do believe, so songbirds in general learn songs from other birds. It's been shown in a variety of species that if they're raised in isolation, their songs are different. They're often quite degraded. We haven't shown that with Lyrebirds, but we can assume they're doing the same thing with their whistle song. The other reason why we're pretty sure they're learning from each other is because all songs in one area are the same. So they sound very similar. Uh, and are they – so they're, they're learning from each other if and they're not pushing their vocalize, vocalizing ability to the limit? They're not show-off or extroverts in a musical sense? Well, it's interesting you say that because – you would think because they have these amazing mimetic repertoires that they can sing such a variety of sounds, but I don't think they're necessarily very good at improvising. So everything they sing, they've learned from something, whether they've learned it from other lyrebirds or whether they've learned it from another species. Okay, so th- th- they're not going to be breaking out a new symphony. Does that mean that over time the scope of their vocalisations is remaining static or is it growing or... Do you think it's decreasing? Have you got any evidence for any of those? I I don't. So what I have is a snapshot of what's been happening in the last couple of years in the populations. What would be really nice is to compare repertoires from the same area from old recordings. I think I, I know there are some recordings from around the 80s done by Sydney Curtis. And it'd be interesting if somebody went back in 20 years or so and recorded them again to see Absolutely. what's going on. Absolutely. So tell us a bit about the behaviour the ecology of the live bird, and then we'll try and see how the work you're doing and the previous work can inform conservation decisions, apart from the obvious one of stop cutting down everything in the jungle. Yeah. So other live birds, all live birds, are mostly ground dwelling. They forage on the forest floor, they scratch and they turn up heaps of dirt and they look for invertebrates that are there. They're also... They're very sedentary, so they're very loyal to one area. They don't move very fast. So lyrebirds are territorial. As far as we know, the they have the same or similar territories every year. And they, the, sorry, it, it, is it dominated by one sex or do males allow multiple females in their territory? Do, do we understand that? I don't think we really know what's going on with that yet it's actually it's quite hard to know what the females are doing because they're so cryptic they're not loud like the males you have to rely on seeing them i believe in the superb lyrebird they're often actually thought to live in slightly different areas 
So I think the males are often on the escarpments and the females are a bit lower in the gullies where there's more food for raising her young. With the Albus livers, we don't know what the distribution of males and females are, but it's likely there is some crossover with the territories, some overlap. Are they polygamous? What's their sort of breeding behaviour? So females are the sole carers of the young. So once they've found a male that they like and they've mated, she goes off and she does everything on her own. She builds the nest on her own. She incubates on her own and she raises the chick on her own. The males will stay in their territory and they'll display away and they'll basically try and attract as many females as they can. Beyond that's all their involvement. So with that kind of behaviour, can we assume that a male has a large territory and because he's in the less choice country and the females because they're lower down in the ha- in the habitat or in the gullies, whatnot, with more food, that they have smaller territories. A male has potentially more females to choose from than the females have males to choose from. It's an interesting question. I suspect it's not quite like that. I think that females actually go roaming to find a mate, so they don't rely on having males within their territory. They probably won't go too far away, but I don't think you would, you know, find one male that has several females within his territory because they still require the same amount of food. I think a lot of this would be how much of an area can an individual defend to maintain its food supply. So that's a good question, Fiona. How big an area can a male live bird defend? So I have found on average about 300 metres between my males. What? Do you, have you got a square metre average of the size of the territory? <laughs> Let me do a very quick calculation. <laughs> I mean, it, all of these numbers are mo- movable feast, but the I'm guessing that the population density is not determined by the size of the territories, but more likely the available habitat. Is that a fair assumption? So it depends on what sort of context you're talking. I believe the estimates of population size are done based on the average territory size. Fitted into the available appropriate habitat. Yes, exactly. But I, I do think in some areas you probably find more lyrebirds crammed into particular areas than in other places mm. they might be more spread out. So you're not going to find the same density of lyrebirds across the range. I mean, that would be too easy. Uh, of course, there's going to be a different carrying capacity in different areas one would, one would expect. And uh, I would doubt that the species mix of the vegetation would be homogenous right through the appropriate habitat, especially as it is so disjointed. And there's separation between ele- elevations. Is that always, is it always elevation that separates the, the males from the females in general? I, I don't think so. I, I think that's anecdotal reports and nobody's really assessed exactly what's going on. So how it, it's your work number of really significant challenges to overcome. One is that you've got the populations that are so distributed so far away from each other. Even though it's a condensed area, it's those roads up there. I mean, it's a long drive to get anywhere in that region. And the just the it's pretty rugged getting up and down some of those slopes. So how are you doing the field work? What's the actual method that you're using? My method is basically, I first of all, before I went into the field, I, I did a bit of research. I looked at occurrence maps on things like the Atlas of Living Australia, just to see where other people had found lyrebirds. I got in contact with some people that knew a bit about Albert's lyrebirds and where to find them. And I identified hotspots of lyrebirds. And then basically I went there I got up very early in the morning and either went for a drive or went for a walk and listened out for them. And when I heard a lyrebird, I was like, okay, that's my first lyrebird. Let's get as close as we can and try and get some nice recordings. Did your, did your assumed hotspots before you ventured out into the field match up with the hotspots you found for real? They did in general, although sometimes it is a bit harder to find lyrebirds than you assume. So lyrebirds actually, we think that they arrange themselves into what are called leks. So males will actually group together and you might find an area that has several territories. And then next to that, there's no lyrebirds, even though it looks like perfectly good habitat. So I might go to a place within, let's take the border ranges, for example. I'll pull up somewhere along the road. I think this is a nice place to pull up. Let's see if there are any lyrebirds here. And you listen and there's nothing. And then you drive another sort of kilometre or so off the road and you found a group of lyrebirds and then you can record several all together. So 
is the distribution of the females dependent on the occurrence of these legs? It's possibly driven the other way around. So all females want to raise their young, essentially. They need to have a territory where they can support themselves and where they can support their offspring. Males want to attract a female so they can pass on their genes. And so it's more likely that the males are driven by where the females are. It's it's, it's perplexing that there's no that, that you're finding anecdotally no lyrebirds in suitable lyrebird habitat or no male lyrebirds in suitable yes. habitat. So does that because in in the non breeding season do is there and the males going like spreading out because it their territory is from what we were discussing earlier is probably has a lower carrying capacity than the females territories so i'm wondering how all the males hang out in you know in the worst neighborhood but at a higher density yeah we do think their territories break down a little bit in the non-breeding season you often okay. see so so during the breeding season you'll only ever see one liver together unless there you've got a couple of males having a territorial dispute or you've got a male and a female together in the non-breeding season sometimes you see groups of two or three or even more live birds together so there is some you know anecdotal evidence that they're using different areas in the non-breeding season okay what season do the albert's live bird breed in it's quoted as march to august I think March is too early. I've been up in the field in May and still not heard anything sometimes. I think the peak of it is across June to July, but they do start in picking up in May and they will still go during August as well. This is probably way outside the scope, I would say, but do you know if there's a trigger that commences breeding? Is it rainfall events or is it like a an eruption of insects or something? I think it's temperature dependent. I think once it gets colder, then the display season starts. That's over the coldest months. But female live birds will actually lay their eggs a lot earlier than other species. So they can be laying their eggs in the middle of winter. I mean, you'll have chicks hatching as early as August sometimes. And yeah, I'm not quite sure why they breed so early compared to other birds. There's some thought that they display in the winter because fewer birds are singing then. And so they have this, they, they have pools. The They've got the stage, exactly. They've got the spotlight. (laughs) And and, and actually, that was another thing that is a point of difference between the two species, where the superb live birds, I've been lucky enough to see the display a few times, they scratch out a big area, which is nice and clear, and then do half a mallee fowl. They make a little hummock Mm. mound or whatever to, to stand on so that everyone can see them. What does the Albert's male do? Yeah, so Albert's live birds are different, which is sometimes annoying when it comes to finding them. Instead of making themselves a little clearing or a mound, they actually use what is called a display platform and they use bits of vegetation that are already in the forest. So this often means vines. They'll often be like a sort of patch of vines that they actually use in their display. Sometimes where there aren't vines available, it'll just be some fallen sticks or branches. I've also seen them using tussocks of grass. So they they like to get a bit elevated. I'm not sure that it's so much elevation because sometimes it, it is on the ground, but they just have three or four really nice vines crossing over that patch. I think it's this vegetation that they can use in their display that's important. Okay. They use it. Have you? Can you characterise that? So when they're dancing, they'll actually grab bits of vegetation with their feet. So sometimes it's a vine and they'll move it while they're dancing. So sometimes they'll grab a bit to the side and they'll shake it. Sometimes they're standing on it and they'll just gently move their foot up and down. But what you get, especially when it's in a nice big clump of vines, is that this whole area of vegetation will start shaking and create an even bigger visual impression than the bird by himself would do. The male Albert's live bird really wants to be a pop star, but the but the superb live bird is perhaps the one that's been working the hardest in the studio and has got the clarity and that and the range and the repertoire. What are the main threats for the live birds apart from human intervention? Who's gobbling them up? Lots of things gobble the chicks. So caraw- actually, caravans go for eggs. So so eggs and chicks are where they're really vulnerable. Things like caravans will get the eggs. There's also been footage of a grey shrike thrush getting a live bird egg. Goshawks, both brown and grey goshawks, are also big live bird predators. But they're also 
vulnerable to attack by foxes and cats. So I know, yeah, there's been footage of foxes getting into live bird nests. And I've definitely, I've seen foxes in some of my field sites and I've seen cats in some of my field sites, which is quite depressing. And it's possible there'd be, they would be able to get the adults as well. But most of what we've seen is nest predation. Okay. So the adults being the size they are, which is... It's about one kilogram. It's about the size of a chicken. Just saying that they're like a bantam with with a long tail, perhaps perhaps a leghorn with a, with a long tail, to give the overseas listeners an idea of the of the size. So we don't really have much that takes on a, a bird that size apart from our introduced predators, do we? Not really. I have seen. It was quite amazing. I was driving out of the field once and I saw a goshawk dive from the sky and then suddenly an adult liebed shoot out from. The undergrowth missing a few feathers so sometimes big birds of prey seem to go for the adults but i think that must have been one very hungry goshawk yeah maybe he wouldn't have to he or she wouldn't need to uh, grab a meal for a day or two if they'd got a live bird one would think how about quoll yeah i'm not sure i suppose quolls are one of those really cryptic species that we also don't know a lot about in terms of their occurrence and their behavior and they're there are meant to be quolls in some areas that there are Albert's lyrebirds. I know that in Lamington National Park they've been looking out for them. But I think quolls are more scavengers, aren't they? So if they, I guess they would probably raid a nest if they found one. It, it, I think most of the quoll research is, is being done in Tasmania, isn't it? And I don't know if we can really, the lyrebirds and introduced uh, species down there. So I, I don't know if we could overlay the experience there to, to what you're saying. But I'm wondering how you see the future because that part of Queensland and New South Wales has for a long time been pretty sparsely settled, but the the small holding, the hobby farm and whatnot is encroaching into that area. And I think the weekend drive is really popular in the valley. How do you see the future of the remaining habitat? I... Yeah, it's pretty dire if you think about some of that habitat being lost because it is such a small area. But I know there are projects looking into conserving what's left and even revegetating some of those areas. Before we can make any predictions about what's going to happen, we actually need to know more about the areas they're using, how many live birds there are and what their actual distribution is. And there are currently some citizen science projects going on encouraging landowners in those areas to look out for live birds on their property and revegetate where they can so that you've got more suitable habitat and, and particularly habitat corridors connecting some of the fragmented populations. So it, it all depends on human attitude and what people want to do. The citizen science projects that are underway now can is it easy for people to to get involved? Do you know what they're called, who's running them? Yeah, so it's being run by Saving Our Species. And New I think South the main, Wales? Yes, and I think the main project is called Trails for Tales. So I can send the link if, if there's a way to put that up. At, actually, we're, um, we're speaking with Linda Bell from Saving Our Species soon. So I, I'll, I'll grill her more on that. So, yeah, I'll certainly put a link to, to Saving Our Species from through the Department of Environment in New South Wales. Is there anything happening in Queensland? That- I, I haven't heard of anything in Queensland. So this does seem like it's all New South Wales focused. Do we have an estimation of where the bulk of the population is on which side of the border? Probably Queensland, I would think. But I, it, it does seem, yeah, I, we don't know. The, again, we don't know the exact numbers, so we don't know exactly where <laughs> They are. I suppose the biggest area that you would find live birds in, again, is that border ranges, Lamington area, which is half New South Wales, half Queensland. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's hard work working in a in an environment like a, a wet forest, a rainforest in winter. How are you collecting the audio samples? And like, how big are your study areas? How much equipment have you got out there in the field? I'm trying to get an idea of the scope of the project. So most of my data that I collected and most of the data that I've used is from handheld recordings. So I have a a recording unit and a microphone and I spend every morning in the field getting up before sunrise and getting as close to these birds as I can and recording them. But I also have some other equipment. So I have motion sensing cameras and when I find display platforms or what I suspect are display platforms, I'll 
set the cameras up and I'm setting them up to record video. So often people will get photos, but I'm trying to get videos in their display. I also have what are called autonomous sound recording units. So these are little boxes with microphones and I can set them to record for a certain amount of time each day. And I also set them up at the platforms just to get me some more recordings. Now, Lyrebirds are actually pretty hard to work on. They're very flighty, especially the Albert's Lyrebird. So if they know that you're getting close, they'll disappear. So you have to be you have to be really sneaky when you're trying to get close. But often it's just I don't manage to get close enough to get good quality footage. So the scope of my research is I've I had five different main field sites and I collected data from about five birds from each site. Sometimes a couple more, but it's yeah. And the sites that you're working on are a long way from where you're based. So how often are you able to make a trip up there and how long do you spend each time you're out in the field? Each time I went up to the field, I spent, I stayed there for the whole breeding season. So I was there for about three months each time, just moving around between my sites. I was camping for most of it, which was very cold, but quite an experience. That's real field work, isn't it? Yeah. That really opens up a number of uh, questions for me, Fiona. I know that area. So how do you, how much supplies are you taking with you for in between each visit to the shop? And how are you cooking on a campfire or are you taking a camper trailer or something like that with you? Are you tramping or are you in a vehicle based? I, I was staying in a tent. So for my, I had two, two main field seasons. The first one, I had a nice big tent. The second year, it was getting too much work to always put up and take down a massive tent, so I just had a little one. But I had a good gas-powered camping stove, brought a little camping table and chairs with me so I can have a set up. And I would usually stay at each site for three or four nights, so I would get whatever I needed in terms of food or water. Most sites I had water there. Sometimes I brought water with me. Yeah, yeah That's incredible. I don't think anyone else I've spoken to has, has been that self-sufficient in the field for <laughs> long periods of time. Yeah, you might want to grab it swag dispense with the tent altogether yeah wow keeping things dry if you're tent based how are you keeping all of your equipment in good working order notebooks etc that must be difficult most of that lived in the car which was easy i had a nice big four-wheel drive both years but i i was also in a way lucky that my my two field season years were in the middle of the drought. So there was hardly any rain in 2019, which was one of my field seasons. And it's also the dry season in that area over the winter. So you don't get as much rainfall as you do in the summer up there, which made things easier. Yeah. I should have asked this earlier on because I'm going way, way back. But are the lyrebirds fruit eaters as well as eating insects? As far as we know, I think they just go for insects. I don't think there's any evidence of them eating fruit. Okay. So they're really, I would think, quite dependent on the moisture levels in the forest then. So is drought a a limiting factor for their breeding success? Almost definitely, yes. So we don't really know a lot about Albert Slybird breeding success. I did spend time looking for nests while I was up there and hardly found anything. So with the help of another Slybird guru, we did find a couple of nests one year but really hardly anything. And I know in the Blue Mountains, so there's someone in my lab who works on female lyrebirds in the Blue Mountains. And she, I think she was finding fewer nests in the years that there were drought compared to after the drought, suddenly they were all nesting. So they really do seem to be rainfall dependent, at least with what they're trying to do. And do we know reliably what the size of a clutch is? One. One. One One egg egg. a year. So... One carawong, one grey strike thrush, one bird can be. That's it. That's so. It's another question you probably can't answer, but it's one that really needs needs an end, an answer from a management point of view. Is are the is the population replacing itself each year? I mean, it it almost sounds like it almost sounds like that's too low to be able to compete with fo- foxes and cats on top of their natural predators that they're adapted to deal with, and then the land clearing and climate change on top of that. It seems a bit gloomy. It does seem a bit dire. And nest predation rates in lyrebirds, from what's been gathered, can be very high. So it's, yeah, they actually, lyrebirds have a very slow life history, so they don't start breeding until they're several years old. So I think males don't start breeding until they're seven or eight. And I think the youngest that a a female has been observed to nest is four years old. But they live for a long time. So 
once they reach maturity, they can have 10 breeding years. And if half of those are successful, then one lyrebird has produced five more lyrebirds. So they don't like to be disturbed, but do they tolerate people being around? If a land if a landowner has lyrebirds on their property, do the lyrebirds mind the landowner going about their business as long as they're not poking their noses into lyrebird business? There have there's a couple of Albert's lyrebirds that have been known to be a bit more approachable. So there was one lyrebird at, at the Green Mountains section of Lamington National Park called George, who was apparently quite approachable and people could watch him display. There's also another lyrebird at Tambourine Mountain that I think a lot of people have managed to see because it's a bit more tolerant of other people. But in general, they're very elusive. So even there might be lyrebirds that live on the edge of somebody's garden, but as soon as they hear somebody come outside, they've disappeared. Yep. So, I, I guess what I was trying to to get to is they're happy. I'm hoping that they're happy to live on the edge of your garden. They won't let you see them, but they they're not going to move on if as long as you leave them alone. They'll hang around if conditions are appropriate. Yeah, I think if you have a vegetable garden on the edge of a patch of rainforest, you'll be able to get lyrebirds in your back garden. <laughs> Good. Just don't just don't let your cat out if you've got one, and keep your dog inside too. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They just sound like they're amazing to see. I've been lucky enough to see the superb lyrebird, as I've said, but I lived in Brisbane for a while and went on many expeditions looking to see or hear Alberts. No, no chance. Didn't know anybody who knew where one was hanging out, though, so I think that's a benefit. Now, what surprised you about the lyrebirds so far from the work you've done? I think what surprised me the most is that lyrebirds are known for being able to produce all sorts of crazy sounds. And they're, because of that you know, wonderful video by David Attenborough that shows the mimicking of chainsaws and cameras and everything, we expect that they can mimic just about everything. What surprised me is they seem to actually be very selective about what they mimic, particularly Albert's lyrebirds. So there's all sorts of different sounds they could be mimicking in the rainforest, but across the range, I've found with the populations I've studied, they're restricted to mimicking about 12 species in their sort of main mimetic display, which is not that many compared to what's in the area. So who are they plagiarising? Who are their favourite? <laughs> Big favourite is the satin bowbird. Every lyrebird mimics multiple satin bowbird calls. <laughs> Another favourite is the king parrot, crimson rosellas, eastern, rob- eastern yellow robins, green catbirds are often mimicked, white-browed scrub wren is another that appears in lots of populations. And then more rarely things like paradise rifle birds, blue and honey eaters, and log runners. It's interesting, Albus lyrebirds, I, I think in some areas they do, but all of none of my birds mimic whipbirds. But that seems to be a favourite of the superb lyrebirds. I read that really interesting paragraph in, in one of the papers you sent me that the lyrebirds in Tasmania are still mimicking whipbirds even though there are no whipbirds in Tasmania. So, yeah. that's, so that shows that the songs are passed down through the generations. That's, yeah, that's stunning. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Have you got a favourite that you've been studying? A favourite bird? Yeah, or a favourite couple. My my favourite bird is one of the males in Main Range National Park in the Goombara section. So that's one of their most northern populations. It's an absolutely stunning area up there. I think it's my favourite field site as well. But there is this one male. I think he was the first one that I found a platform for. And when I set up a camera, I got hours and hours of footage of him. I think he's, out of all the birds I've filmed, he's one of the top performers. So one morning, I think he was on his platform for, I think, three hours do you think he was aware of you? When I recorded him, he knew I was there and he, he disappeared once I got too close. But in terms of actually leaving equipment there, they might notice it, but they don't seem at all perturbed by having cameras or recording equipment there. Okay. Are they? Do they have personalities from what you've been able to ascertain? Are they are different birds that you've been watching display? Are they noticeably different in the way they behave? They are in that some of them are a lot more bold than others. So some of the lyrebirds are notoriously difficult to follow. And as soon as on the edge of their territory, they stop seeing and disappear. Whereas others you can get a lot closer to and they don't seem to mind as much. Yeah, again, this would probably just be a matter of, of opinion, but do you think that's because of a familiarity with people that those lyrebirds are in an area where they're 
more often in contact with people? I think it might be more to do with maybe the lyrebird's age or how dominant he is. If they have dominance hierarchies, we don't really know about that. But basically, if he's a really top male and he knows that he can outrun a predator or whatever, he might stick around a bit longer. Because sometimes within an area that would experience similar numbers of humans, you've got slightly different responses of the lyrebirds. Okay, when does your project wrap up and what are you hoping you will learn. I am actually in the final stages of my PhD now. So I'm trying, if possible, to finish my thesis before the next live bird field season begins. But it's, yeah, it's, we'll see. What are the challenges with analysing all the data that that you have collected? Acoustic data is very difficult to analyse. Not only do you have to go and collect all the recordings, which takes a lot of time and effort, once you've got the recordings, you need to extract data from it. And so that takes, yeah, that takes out, first of all, you have to decide what you actually want from the recordings you've collected. And then it takes hours and hours of measurement to actually get numbers from that. And you have to work out what are the variables you're interested in, what kind of sample size do you need, all of that stuff. So it it takes a long time. Now, for those of us who are not a disciplined scientist, how hard is it to make those decisions about what you include and what you exclude? It's quite difficult because... Often when you have behavioural or ecological data, you have so much that you can look at and you really have to focus on what is your question? What do I need to answer this question? And in terms of choosing variables, what do I think is most biologically relevant as well as robust? So I, I take acoustic measurements from my recordings. So that includes things like the pitch and duration of songs, but it can also include things like the amplitude or something called entropy, which is the spread of the energy in that unit, in that vocalization. And some of those are more robust measurements than others. So things like amplitude and entropy can be affected by recording conditions. So they're not as good to compare between recordings as things like pitch and duration. So you have to be be careful. It's probably not a fair question to ask you on the fly. I probably should have pre-warned you with this, but you mentioned you had to decide what are the questions that you want to answer and the questions that, that you're really putting the data to. If that makes sense. What are your what are the two or three major questions that you are attempting to find some kind of answer to? Oh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of questions. Some of them are more specific and some of them are broad. So some of the broad questions that I'm hoping to answer are one of them is what are the live birds learning from, particularly with regards to the mimicry? So they learn the mimicry from the model species, the other species in the environment, or from other live birds. And that can be done by asking questions such as, are the repertoires of neighbouring live birds the same or different? Is the way they sing their mimicry, the order of the of the mimetic vocalisations they sing, is it the same between neighbouring males or is it different? Another but, question I'm in, sorry. No, go on. I was going to say another question that I'm trying to answer is, what determines the actual diversity in their vocalizations in an individual's vocalization what determines the number of species that he mimics or the number of vocalizations from different species that he mimics yeah yeah is it age is it the proximity to other males is it their relative randiness who knows yeah (laughs) who knows so how do you think what you will find out can be applied to the conservation decisions that need to be made in the future so One of the things I'm trying to do is look at how sort of similarities in vocalizations between different populations of lyrebirds is related to the geographic connectivity of those populations. So we're trying to understand from a a geographic perspective what drives the variation in this species. And so then we can use that to understand a little bit more about how connected the lyrebird populations are. So are they moving between different patches or are they completely static? And I think there's a long way to go before we can apply this sort of acoustic or behavioural research to conservation, but I think this is just documenting the diversity that there is a good first step that we can take. So when you've written this one up and it's been accepted and approved and you're Dr Fiona, what do you think is next for you? That is the big question. I would love to keep working on something similar. It'd be nice if it was like with lyrebirds. I would also be interested in working with other species. But I've really gotten interested in the sort of discussions of behavioural diversity and 
what that can tell us or how that can help us with conservation. So I'd love to keep doing similar things, but from move even further into conservation. Do you think tracking is something that will be applied to lyrebird research in the future? Because it's now become a bit more affordable, I think, to have the GPS trackers attached to birds. Do you think they'll handle being trapped and harnessed? The trouble with lyrebirds is they're extremely difficult to catch. So they're they have catching superb lyrebirds in some areas, particularly as a population down in Victoria, where most of their catching involves getting birds at the nest. So the easiest birds to capture and get data from are chicks and their mothers. Finding nests of Albert's lyrebirds has proved very difficult. And I think capturing the males is also almost impossible. So logistically, that first step of actually getting transmitters onto the bird is very difficult. Then the later step of getting the transmitters back would be equally difficult. So, yeah. so vi- visual surveillance is a much more appropriate way to study the species. Or audio surveillance. Audio so surveillance. what a lot of, yeah, the main way of actually censusing lyrebirds is by listening for the males because you can count the males using that. So that sounds like that might be a good continuation project to Fiona. Now, you mentioned before before we started, that you've got some research partners in this project. So do you want to give them a, a shout out and a, hey, thanks for your money? Yes. So BirdLife Northern New South Wales very generously provided me with some money in my first year, which paid for my cameras, which got me some beautiful footage that is lovely to use. It's great for understanding the behavior of the live birds. Also makes great material for putting into talks and getting people interested in the species. But we also have a partnership with some scientists at Cornell University in the United States. So they're interested in cultural evolution in birds in general and lyrebirds are a very interesting species to do that with. So they've partnered with us. We collect the data. Sometimes they they send students over to help us collect the data and then we analyse and write it up together. That's great. What cameras are you using? Just I'm interested in that. I've used a couple of different cameras. There's a brand called Stealth Cam which I've used. I think the model was DS4K, but our lab often use Bushnell's, the aggressor model, and they've proved to be really good. So they seem to be very, they can deal with rain and all that kind of stuff and take very nice quality videos. And I'm a bit of a sound equipment nerd. So what's your handheld recorder and are you using a directional shotgun mic with a parabola? Uh, so the, the little recording unit is a Marantz. I can't remember off the top of my head which model number, but it's a Marantz and then we use a shotgun microphone that has a a softy over it. We don't have a parabola or anything. We just use a shotgun so we can get very directional sounds. Ripper. All right, Fiona, now we have to get into the bird nerd spectrum part of the the show. What is your field guide of choice when you're out there in the field? That's a difficult question because I can't remember who wrote it. (laughs) It's a red cover. It's, it's one of the recent Birds of Australia books. I should offer a prize for the p- first person to hit me up on Twitter with the correct name. I know. <laughs> it's meant to be a favourite of, of ornithologists in Australia. I think I know the, the one you mean, and I think it is probably the most recent new publication, not reissue, but new publication. So, yes, I, I might do that. I might offer a bird emergency T-shirt for the first person who hits me up on Twitter with the right answer. That's cool. What's your favourite piece of field equipment? My gaiters, actually. I I wear gaiters. Partly, there's not much in terms of reptile activity over the winter, but there is some, and also there's just a lot of spiky vegetation, and I feel secure with my gaiters on. I feel exposed. Actually, it's for the leeches that I wear. I, that was what I was saying. <laughs> Every time I've worn them, it's to stop leeches because they're a bugger. And and ticks too. But yeah. That's the first. That's the first time anyone has said gators. Have you got a favorite bird? Now that's an, probably Ooh. an obvious question. All right. If, if we're going a favorite bird that's not the Albert Sly bird, it's the magpie, the Australian magpie. I've always been fascinated by them. I think they are one of the most impressive songsters that we have and they're incredibly intelligent as well they're so personable you can really understand the different magpie personalities yes i have two families who duel over the park across the road from my house so there's a, well, it's actually an east and west families one of them is dominant at the moment in the park but their male is very nasty is he a swooper he, he's not so much a swooper of people but he will not tolerate wattlebirds he won't tolerate honey eaters. 
he's overwhelmed by lorikeets, but he doesn't like them. He won't let the galahs near. The corell, the corellas bite back, so he tolerates them. But he's really nasty. In the ebb and flow, when sometimes the other group get to use the park, their mark doesn't seem to mind anybody. Yeah. But, yeah, they do have very definite personalities. The mothers are very good mothers, or the mother in the group I've got now is a very good mother. She takes all the chicks under her wing. She's She manages to do three or four every year. Oh, pretty, yeah, she's pretty amazing. Impressive. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, then, talking about your favourite bird, it's my, what's on your bucket list in terms of bird? Oh, that's a really good question. Probably penguins. Any sort of penguin. I've seen fairy penguins when I was a kid. I'd love to to see... Did you go to the penguin parade as a kid? No, these were, I think there was a penguins at, near Bishano in Tasmania that I saw. Okay. If you love penguins, you have to go to the penguin parade. That's, you can't beat that on film. <laughs> it's pretty dorky, but it, it's pretty fun. And is there like a location that you are absolutely hanging out to get to? South America, anywhere in South America. I think really? they have some. I think they have some really wacky birds um, yeah. around there, and some of the highest diversity of birds in the world as well. Yeah, yeah. But are you looking for forest birds? You're looking. I mean, you're wanting to forest. go on, on the steps. You're looking to go to the jungle, aren't you? But yeah, I would think yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you can go to the Atacama Desert or whatever you want, but you ain't seeing any macaws there. Where is your favourite spot that you? have gone birding or like to go birding? So a few years ago, I had the absolute privilege of working on an island or an an archipelago of islands called St Kilda in Scotland, which is a little group of islands way off the west coast of Scotland. And it's a major breeding ground for all sorts of seabirds. So So they have a puffin colony. You've you've seen the puffin. I have. That's why if if I hadn't already seen puffins, that would have been my bucket list bird. Yeah, I think that's the favourite of so many people. So... Do you maintain a list? Do you know your number? I do not go that far as having a list. I, I appreciate birds when I see them and I like to, to know what I'm looking at, but yeah, I haven't so, really kept track. So on a day out in the field, you'll happily sit and watch a group of scrub wrens go about their business rather than you've got to trek for another four kilometres yeah. to get the next one. I've always loved animal behaviour. So if, if I'm out in the bush or out in the field, my favourite thing is to just observe what's going on, not necessarily to look for as many different things as I can, but to just see what they're doing. Well, so maybe extend. my bucket list is bird behaviour rather than bird species. Let's extend the, the questions a little bit further than I normally do. Are you more an animal nerd or are you now firmly a bird nerd? I'm definitely animals in general. Okay. What do you want to study or what is the favourite that you've already had a dip at? I've, I'm yet to study anything that's not a bird, which is why I think I often <laughs> fell under the umbrella of, of birds. I I would love to study quolls, actually, or Tasmanian devils or something. You're going to have to relocate, huh? Tasmania, what a shame. Yeah, Beautiful well, place. A couple of extra pairs of, of britches so you can wear three at a time. <laughs> I never forget when I moved to Brisbane and it was 13 degrees and I was still walking around in shorts and a T-shirt and my housemates were, were actually going out to buy long johns and were wearing uh, wearing <laughs> two two woolen jumpers. And I'm thinking, wow, this is crazy. <laughs> it's what w- Would you move to Tasmania? Yeah. Yeah. I like the cold. Okay. I think Tasmania is beautiful. Okay. Well, there we go. Anyone who's got a postdoc project in the carnivores of Tasmania, just keep Fiona in mind. Right. Fiona, thanks again for speaking to us, giving us so much of your time. What's your timeline for your project now? And will you give us an update when you've completed it, when you've handed in your homework? Let me just check what's the date today. I think my timeline is to submit in about five and a half weeks from today. So it's getting very close and I will most definitely post about it when it's done. Fabulous. Well, you'll give us an update. I want to, I want to get into the habit of, of reviewing when people publish, but I always miss it. <laughs> Make sure you let me know. Okay. Fiona Backhouse, that's been an illuminating discussion. I feel like I have to go and find, track down that David Attenborough episode of The Live Bird and, and have a look at it again tonight. Is, is there any good footage that you know of the Albert's Live Bird that people could hunt up? There's not very much publicly available. If you search Albert's Live Bird on YouTube, there's a couple of nice videos of their displays that come up. There's also, there was a small documentary. I'm just trying to remember who made it. I think it was co-produced by people at O'Reilly's and it's called Albert's Live Bird, Prince of the Rainforest. 
which is quite a nice little film. Okay, well, I'll hunt that down and, and put a link to that because I think it always helps when we're, we're talking about songs and displays and, of course, we haven't played any of them, so people might like to know about that. Thanks again, Fiona. All the best with meeting your deadline. I'm guessing lots of home deliveries and not too many uh, nights out. Yeah, that's about it. Terrific. Thanks. It's been The Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. Thank you very much for listening.